Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning, and uh, we'll get started. I know there's still people out purchasing books and things, but we'll we'll get started and, and move on. For those of you who were here for the uh, first session and you got to hear Joel, Tay, Sherry, you know that uh, this is really a treat today. We're very thankful to have him here. I want to explain just a couple things for you. Um, this is not going to be like a normal Sunday morning service for us. Uh, you probably already figured that out, and that's fine. A um, couple things that I did want you to know is at the end, don't get up in the middle, but at the end, you can go back out into the lobby and uh, take advantage of the books and uh, the resources that are available there. There's going to be two times during the service, one toward the beginning, one at the very end, and take an offering. And uh, it's not unusual for us to take an offering. God blesses and, and helps us with our ministries. Uh, but I am going to mention to you that if you would like to give a gift to the uh, Creation Mission uh, Ministries International, that would be very, very appropriate. It helps support Joel and his ministries and his travel and all that. Uh, what you can simply do is, I'm just going to let you know, anything that is not designated otherwise, uh, on your offering, um, then we'll just give that to their ministry. So, so if you just throw, you know, a thousand dollar bill in there, that's fine. It'll go to them. Um, but if you put my name on it, then there's pizza for everybody. So, um, but anyhow, uh, we'll take that offering later on uh, this morning. So, uh, in just a moment, we'll have Joel come and share. But let's pray once again. Lord, thank you so much for the uh, exciting information that we've already heard this morning. Thank you that uh, Joel was able to be here with us and to share from his heart, share from his mind. And uh, thank you that all evidences point to a great and wonderful God who we know and love through the person of Jesus Christ. And we, and we serve and today we worship you with our hearts and our lives. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be challenged about um, the view and how it affects us and our culture. I just pray that you would give wisdom to Joel, help him as he presents this, and give us insights from your Holy Spirit so that we can apply these truths, this wisdom, to our own hearts and lives and live stronger testimonies for you. Thank you for your grace and mercy that we have through Christ our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, in case uh, I didn't say a lot of this earlier, but with Joel being here with us, it's probably good for you to know that he, he does have credentials. So uh, I'm going to let you know that he has a couple master's degree um, in theology, also in divinity. So he studied the, the biblical evidence, and he has also his bachelor's degrees in evolutionary biology and genetics, and also uh, a diploma in biotechnology. Uh, he spent time in Australia serving there. He also, when he was there, served an internship with uh, Ravi Zacharias. So you're familiar with him. And he served in those ministries helping there. And uh, he's been a part of Campus Crusade. And so he has a multitude of experience and a uh, great background. He's uh, got a wife, Joyce, and a, and a daughter, Josephine, and they allowed him to come and be here with us today. So we're very thankful for that. So thank you so much, Joel. Great to have you. Good morning, church. Good morning. Can I have a show of hands? How many of you were here for the first session? Okay. So for those who are not here, just for a quick reintroduction. As we say, I'm from Singapore, and if you do not know where Singapore is, it's on the other side of the world. So that, that little dog there, that's Singapore. So I'm here with my American wife, um, Joyce, and we have a little baby. So that's Creation Ministries. So I work for Creation Ministries. For those who were not in the first session, we are an international ministry, and our objective is to go to churches to teach them about creation and evolution. So every year we give over a thousand presentations just on this topic alone. And we have more PhD scientists than any other Christian organization. So this is my family, my little girl, and my wife. So our office is in Georgia, 
and we give presentations all around the world, and we are information ministry. But what do I mean when I say we are an information ministry? Well, just put it this way. How many of you have ever had questions like this as a science proven evolution and millions of years to be fact? And is there evidence for worldwide flood? Don't fossils prove millions of years? And did God use evolution and millions of years to create? And if God is a God of love, why is there death and suffering? If at some point in time in your life you ever had questions like that, please raise your hands. Can you do me a favor, leave your hands up there? Can you take a quick look around you? you see that? Your hands down? See, that's almost 90% of all of you. I think if you're going to be honest with ourselves, at some point in time in our life, we always have questions like this. And that's what I mean when I say we are an information ministry. We exist to provide information, equip you guys, so that you can take this, reach out to your friends and families. Because as we have seen, we all have the same questions. So like I said, we have a website, 11,500 articles on creation evolution. That's creation.com. So before I get into the actual presentation, I would like to introduce to you all to our, to our free email newsletter. And so what is this? It's just uh, a, a newsletter that we send out to you once a week on the email. It's free of charge. We do not spam you and we do not sell your information. It's just to keep you up to date with the latest news. So once a week, so what, what's that? Just imagine today you go home and the newspaper is saying the latest eight men has been found. And then your neighbor comes up to you and says, ha, how do you answer that? If you are subscribed to our email newsletter, chances are at the end of the week, we would have a reply waiting for you. All you have to do, forward our reply to your friend, and you can use that as a stepping stone to share the gospel with them. And so that is a way you can equip yourself to, to reach out to your friends, families, and colleagues. So if you're interested in this, um, this is a free email newsletter. In a moment's time, I'll get a volunteer to hand that out. Just have to fill in the details, your email address, and when I get back to the office, I'll key that into our database. So volunteers, if you want, you can hand that out. As they're doing that, let me get into my presentations. Into my presentation. So one of the things that, um, if you listen to the introduction earlier on, I have a science degree. And my science degree is in evolution as well as genetics. And when people hear that, they always ask me this question. Why would a Christian study evolution? You see, I spent four years in Australia. And when I was there, every week, I would spend at least three hours on the street doing street evangelism. And for those, the four years I was there, every single week I was there, I would always get the same kind of questions. There would be at least one person every week who would ask me a question related to creation and evolution. And the number two biggest question is this, if God is a God of love, why is there so much death and suffering? And to answer these two, these two questions, we need to go back to what the Bible says in Genesis and how sin, death, and suffering entered the world. So to me, I believe that this is one of the biggest questions that people have, one of the biggest stumbling blocks to why they're not even open to the gospel in the first place. As I mentioned in the first session, many people, when they go to school, they all go to libraries, the newspapers, they only hear one story. What do they hear? Creation or evolution? Evolution, the idea of millions of years. And it's like this boy, he goes to school and he reads all these millions of years. And he goes to school, his friend Johnny, Johnny tries to reach out to him. And Johnny says this, Jesus died for sinners, the Bible says so. And he turns around, he says, the Bible isn't true. He asks his friend, hey, Johnny, what about eight men? Where do dinosaurs fit in the Bible? What about carbon fourteen dating? And could God have created over millions of years? The same kind of question that 90% of my hands went up. His friends say, I don't know. And he says, see, I told you the Bible isn't true. Friends, do you think Johnny's witnessing will be effective? No. But it's worse than that, because now Johnny has all these questions. And he goes home, Mom, Dad, can you answer these questions? And does he get any answers? Is that and you surprised that we get people writing in to us. Here somebody wrote in, a youth leader. I used to beat my head against a wall wondering why we lost all our young people at age 16. I realized age 16 is when they teach evolution in depth and science. 
Some of the teachers actually identify the Christian students and make a special point of explaining the differences and difficulties in reconciling Genesis and the facts of evolution. It's no wonder we lost them. I come near tears thinking about it. Here's a college chaplain. This constant brainwashing is talking about evolution. Destroy the faith of many Christians each year. Our surveys indicate that 80% of first year students believe in a God who is there. By the second year, only 15% believe in God. These two testimonies that you read, this is from Australia. In the States, it's actually worse. Why? Because in the States, we do not wait till the 16th. They first learn about evolution, even from fourth grade. And even before that, they may not even say evolution. But this whole idea of millions of years already, what's that? That is very much the evolutionary process over time. And that's why major denominations in the United States have done surveys. And when they come to similar conclusions, they wanted to look at how many percent of kids who grew up in church we know. For example, Southern Baptist Convention tells us that 88% of kids who grew up in church with a church background, when they get to college, 88% of them leave the faith never to return. Life of a survey, 70%. Assembly of God, 66%. George Barnard, 61%. What figure is acceptable? See, when we see things like this, that two in every three leave the faith when they get to college, we need to ask another question. Why? What is the cause of that? What is preventing these kids from being open to the gospel? So two years ago, my CEO, Gary Bates, he did an experiment. And what he did basically was he went to the colleges in Georgia and he interviewed hundreds of students. And we call that a follow-up project. And what we have here is that we ask all these students a simple question. Do you have a church background? If they say yes, they grew up in church, we interviewed them. The rest who did not grow up in church, we excluded them. We just wanted to see kids who grew up in church, right? And from this group, we asked a second question. Do you believe in creation or evolution? And the vast majority actually said evolution. So to this evolution group who grew up in church, we asked a third question. Has the church ever shown you how science supports the Bible? Every single one said no. And the fourth question, do you still attend church? And every single one of those kids, except for one guy, no longer attends church. And then we went to the group that believes in creation. Has the church shown you how science supports the Bible? Every single one said yes. Do you still attend church? And every single one of those kids still attend church. And like I said earlier on, when we see that statistic 2 in 3 fall away, we need to ask the question, why? And I believe that creation and evolution is the biggest intellectual stumbling block of people coming to the faith. And that's actually what we call a follow-up project. And you know, the 80s, they know that as well. You see, some churches we go to, pastors, they do not want to teach about this. They say it's controversial. Or they say, you know, why can't we just say that God used evolution? Why do we have to stir this up and you know, create all this controversy? But our studies show, as I already indicate, that kids who are not shown to defend the faith, once they believe in evolution, when they get to college, they leave the faith. And the atheists know that. In fact, in this book, he is an atheist. He's not shy about it. He encourages his fellow atheists to do this. Make allies be cooperative. We need help. Build bridges. Work with religious groups. Our best allies for defending evolution are members of the mainstream clergy. See, he knows that if you can get a church teaching evolution, it will lead to an exodus much later on. Many people will be leaving the faith. Here is another project. It's a sample letter. Dear Reverend, I'm writing to you in the hope that you will join with thousands of clergy and congregation to demonstrate that religion and science can comfortably coexist. Of course, what he means by that is evolution. But you see, the Bible gives us this verse. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your heart, honor Christ the Lord is holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason that for the reason for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Friends, is this a request or a command? Command. See, many times when I speak on creation and evolution, people come up to me and say, Oh, you know the Bible says this, I just believe the Bible. And that's fantastic because our foundation has to be the Word of God. But it's not enough to stop there, because we know that this is a command. God commands us not just to believe the Gospel, which is the most important 
thing. But we have to also equip ourselves so that we can defend the faith, so that we can make a difference in the life of friends, families, and those around us. If you want to be a faithful Christian, you need to make a commitment to say, yes, I'll equip myself to be able to defend the faith. See, sometimes when you ask a friend, why do you leave the church? They will not say evolution, right? They will not say millions of years. Those are already assumed. They will, here I have two trees. Those bad friends, they will name all these trees on the left side. So on the right side, you have what the Bible says. On the left side, the worldly view. They say, oh, I, I left the church because I disagree with the church view of racism. I disagree with the church view of gay marriage. I disagree with the church view of murder or abortion and things like that. But is that the real issue? Or is that a symptom of a much deeper issue? And what was the issue here? It boils down to this question, can God's word be trusted? Isn't it? You see, if God is our creator, then we are his creation, then God has the right to tell us what is right and wrong. If we believe that, then automatically all these things we will embrace. But if we believe that we are just a product of evolution over millions of years, we believe that God is our creator, then man decides our own truth. That's where you get the tree on the left. It boils down to this very question, and that's even the reason why we're here speaking about evolution. Can God's word be trusted? And if you believe that God's our creator and that he tells us what is right and wrong, then everything on the left just collapses just like that. In a moment's time, I'll be speaking about science. And do not worry, this session will not be as heavy as the last one. But when I speak about science, I'd like to ask this question. Who has more evidence? Creation or evolution? So let's all choose something, right? Who thinks that evolution has more evidence? Who says creation? Who says the same? Who says, I don't know? <laughs> okay. Alright, let me try to phrase it in a certain way, this way. Okay, so here I have in my hands a proposal clam. Okay, so you're looking at this clam. Two scientists, one creationist, one evolutionist, when they're looking at this clam before your very eyes, are they looking at the same clam or different clam? Same. Two astronomers looking at a star, are they looking at the same star or different star? Same. Same. So let me try to ask that question again. Who has more evidence, creation or evolution? Same. Still not sure? You see, they actually have the same evidence. And the reason they come to different conclusions is not because they have a different evidence, but because they interpret that evidence differently based on a different starting point. You see, when we talk about science, what comes to mind? If you're like me, I think when you say science, I think of laptops, I think of technology. But that is what we call operational science or experimental science. Right? That's what gives us all these things that we see around here. So what, what's operational science? The science that's in the present, the science that's observable, science that is repeatable, and science that is testable. So just to show you what I mean by that, here there's a big ball and a small ball. If I were to let go of both balls at the same time, which will hit the floor first? Who says the big ball? Small? Same? Let's try it out. What's the answer? If you are not sure, what can you do? Just do it over and over again. So that's experimental science or operational science. But you see, when we are speaking about creation or evolution, we are dealing with very different kind of science. We are dealing with what we call historical science, or even forensic science. And historical science is different because the science is not in the present, it's not observable, it's not testable, it's not repeatable. In other words, experimentation is not possible. And what do I mean by that? You see, I grew up in World War II. Yeah, so I grew up today, but my grandmother grew up in World War II. <laughs> okay, so if I want to find out what happened in World War II, what can I do? Well, I can interview my grandmother. I can go to the libraries. You know, I can do a look at videos about World War II. But whatever I'm doing is in the present. See, I cannot go back into the past and observe World War II for myself. I cannot go back to the past and do experiments on World War II. So because I'm not able to carry out those experiments in the present, I have a, I'm not able to remove a lot of the false understanding that I have. All I can do is look at things in the past and try to reconstruct what it was like back then. So when it comes to historical science, it's much more subjective compared to operational science. 
And you must understand that it's not the evidence that changed. It's our starting worldview that is different, that leads us to interpret that evidence differently. I'll try to explain if you're still finding it a little bit hard to understand why this is important. So here I have two lines or two semicircles, all right? So again, what's missing and how did this look like originally? I want everybody to choose something, all right? Who thinks the original picture, the original missing picture, it used to be A? Anybody say A? B? C? I see a B. C? A few C? A few happy faces? And D? A few more Ds? Okay. Do you want to know the answer? Nothing. <laughs> you laugh. Nothing's missing because that's how I drew it. But you see, I tricked you. But that's my point, isn't it? Why did you think something was missing? It was a leading question. I suggested to you that something was missing. And so with that understanding, you look at the evidence and you came to a conclusion that was completely wrong. In fact, it doesn't matter whether you choose A, B, C, or D. Your conclusion will be entirely consistent with the two semicircles. But because you had the wrong starting point, you came to the wrong conclusion. Now imagine we had to redo the entire thing. And before I show you those four options, I suggested to you, consider the possibility that nothing is missing. And then I show you the same thing again. Would you have said, choose one of those four? Do you see how having a different starting point, a different worldview, brings you to interpret the evidence to a very different conclusion? And that's actually what's happening when we are sp speaking about creation and evolution. The world, when you look at those, you see, look at those small layers, that's evidence of millions of years of death, disease, and suffering, and fossils. But may I encourage you to look at those things with biblical glasses, start the Word of God, and look at those evidence. And those rock layers are no longer evidence of millions of years of death and suffering. Those rock layers, taking God's Word as our authority, will now become evidence of 6,000 year old creation, no death before the fall, no worse flood, and things like that. How many of you will have visited the Grand Canyon? Oh, that's a lot of you, hands down. Well, if you see the Grand Canyon, you'll be familiar with all this. Do you see the millions of years there in the rock layers? No. What are you looking at? Rock layers, that's the evidence. What's the interpretation? Millions of years. So take a step back and learn to separate the evidence from the interpretation. So here we're looking at the rock layers. And what are in those rock layers? That's sedimentary rock, rock laid down by water. And we have bones, fossils in those rock layers. So evolutionists say that that formed over millions of years. The Bible says there's a worldwide flood. That's why we get all these sedimentary rocks with fossil layers. So in fact, who is right? So earlier on, I mentioned to you that this is a fossil planet. And do we know that actually every, every mountain range in the world, the top of every mountain range in the world, is actually covered with marine fossils, even the top of Mount Everest? How did it get there? And the evolutionists, in fact, they will agree. They say, yeah, we know that there are fossils at the top of Mount Everest, but Mount Everest was once under the ocean, and over millions of years, those rock layers were being pushed up. The Bible said there was a worldwide flood, and, after, and all these things were buried. After the flood, the Bible said the mountain rose, vanishing very quickly, and soon, very soon after the flood, we have all these new high mountains being pushed up. And that's why we see marine fossils at the top of Mount Everest. You see how the same evidence, but two different interpretations. So who is right? I say that when you start the Word of God, it makes much more sense. How? How many of you here have cooked clams? When you cook them, do they remain closed or do they open up? They open up because the ligament breaks down, they open up. In fact, if you go to the seashore, you go to the beach, you see the, the fossil clams. After a few days after the dye, the top half separates from the bottom half. So why is it? If the top half separates from the bottom half, how do we get a fossil clam that's in a closed position? Is that slow gradual process when it be buried? Or is that rapid burial? Rapid burial. It's not just one, because the vast majority of fossil clams that we find are actually all in a closed position. In fact, these fossil clams are on the table there as well. Look at that. 
you notice that how they are all in a closed position? See, again, same evidence, different interpretation. But you start with what the Word of God says about worldwide flood. All these things begin to make much more sense. That's catastrophe, not slow, gradual process. All the closed position, look at that. It's like this cartoon said, Clamp, this cartoon says this clamp heavy, right? I wasn't even dead yet. It happened so suddenly. It happened to my entire family. I couldn't even open up. <laughs> See, friends, let us learn to start the Word of God. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 to 9 that God sent a worldwide flood that destroyed all life on the earth, all, yeah, except for the sea creatures where they are fish. But everything that breathed air through its nostrils and the birds, they all died except for those on board the ark. So what does the Bible actually say? In 2 Peter chapter 3, it says this, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days scoffing, following their own evil desires. What are scoffers? Unbelievers, people come mocking the Bible. Verse 4, They will say, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Uniform materialism, slow gradual process. There's no flood, there's no catastrophe. It continues. For they deliberately overlooked this fact. The heavens existed long ago when the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of this, the word that then existed was deluged with water and perished. See, evolution teaches the world when the beginning was hot, molten lava that cooled out before the ocean formed. The Bible says that the earth at the beginning was wet, was water. So they deny that. And then they deny what? The worldwide flood. So in the last days, scoffers will come along denying the worldwide flood. But it doesn't just stop there. It says this, they deliberately overlook. What is that? If you have to deliberately overlook something, it tells me that with the right starting point, the right biblical glasses, I should be able to see evidence of the flood all around. In fact, let us look at the evidence for that. Here we have a picture of Mount St. Helens. How many of you were around when Mount St. Helens erupted? Quite a few of you. If you notice something about Mount St. Helens, it's strange because there's a hole inside. You see, this volcano when it erupted did not just blow its top, it blew its side. And when that happened in 1980, we saw many interesting things happening. See, here you actually have a person for scale. This entire cliff was formed in three events, each taking less than a single day. This first layer, this was when it erupted, that's the volcanic ash. You see that? Not millions of years. Rapid. And then we have the second layer. When it blew its side, hot ash and debris ran down the mountainside. And this entire second layer was formed in just three hours. Let us zoom into the second layer. Okay. Do you see that? Do you see all that little micro laminations there? If you open a geology textbook today, they will say that each of those lines must have taken one year to form. This is a record of tens of thousands of years. But remember what I said about operational science and seeing things in the present. When Mount St. Helens erupted, this entire layer formed in just three hours. See, friends, if you have a catastrophe, you do not need millions of years for these things to form. They form very quickly. And then the third layer was formed in less than a day when a mud flow ran through that area. Friends, you see how a worldwide flood would have caused something like that to occur very quickly without the need of millions of years. All the sedimentary rock, uh, even volcanic rock, would be laid down quickly. But you say to me, okay, so maybe you're right that rock layers can form quickly if there's a catastrophe. But you know what? I've been to the Grand Canyon and we all know that there's the Colorado River going through the Grand Canyon. Look at the high sites. That river must have taken millions of years to cover up that canyon. Really? Let's go back to Mount St. Helens. Do you remember what I said? That the top one was a mud flow that ran through the area. When that mud flow ran through the area, it actually covered up a canyon in less than a single day through hard rock. In fact, that canyon today is known as Little Grand Canyon. That's because it's one fortieth the size of the Grand Canyon. And friends, Mount St. Helens is a tiny volcano compared to worldwide flood. Can you imagine what a worldwide flood would have done? A flood that taken over a year. If you look at this, in fact, you see the same high sites that you see the Colorado River. Not millions of years. 
and you see the river that flows in the center? Did that river take millions of years to cover up this canyon? Or was the river what was left after the catastrophe? You see how starting with a flood makes such a big difference. But you say to me, okay, so you're right, rock layers can form quickly, canyons can be covered quickly if there's a catastrophe. But you said earlier on that they contain fossils. Everybody knows fossils takes millions of years to form. Does it? I really covered some of this in the first session. But how does a fossil form? If you go to the museum, this is what it says. A dinosaur dies, it sinks to the bottom. Right? And over millions of years, it's slowly being buried up. And there's all the rock layers you see there. And one day, due to erosion, due to construction, building a road, you cut through the rocks, so it through the layers. And what you see are the exposed bones. And that's how you get a fossil. But can you really get a fossil forming that way? It's actually very hard. How many of you have seen documentaries of the ocean floor or even go scuba diving? Here in you know, Great Barrier Reef. Is the ocean floor covered with millions of fish waiting to be buried? No, why not? Well, they get eaten away, right? They decay. Just do a simple experiment. So here we have Freddy the fish, right? So Freddy is swimming, and when nobody is looking, you take a few drops of cyanide. <laughs> Poor Freddy, right? If this happens in the ocean, what, what, what happens? It dies, it floats to the top, other fish come, bite at it, within a few days, grabs fall to the bottom, lobster scavengers come along, and within a few weeks, nothing is left. How then do you get a fossil? By slow gradual process. So you can only get a fossil with the rapid barrier, so that it's forever buried in that position. And for the sake of those who are not in the first session, let me go through this again. Here you have a pig carcass. This was tied down so it doesn't float away. It was placed in deep water, uh, low oxygen water, cold waters, so it doesn't decay that quickly. And they put a big cage so the sharks and big fish were not in there. Just looking at what scavengers could do, like lobsters, to this in a week. And the next picture, this same pig seven days later. Do you see how it falls apart? How scattered the bones are? It doesn't fall in a nicely preserved position. So how they can you get a fossil forming over long periods of time, millions of years? It doesn't make sense. And here, in fact, we have a marine reptile. And do you notice how well preserved this is? It's not scattered about. In fact, this fossil, I can tell you, that forms so quickly, I can even tell you that this is a female. And how can I tell it's a female? You see the circle? It's giving birth. I know some of you ladies, your stories of long labor. Did that take a million years? <laughs> you see, friends, when you see something like that, you can only explain it with a huge watery catastrophe. Flood conditions at a worldwide scale that caused millions of dead things to be buried in the rock layers. So in Creation Magazine, I'll talk about that a little bit more. But this is a quarterly magazine that we uh, have every quarter. We talk about buried birth. See, sometimes I share so many things that I don't expect you guys to remember everything. In fact, even if you can remember a little bit, that's enough. But do you think you can take a magazine with this picture and go to a friend and say, hey, look at this, and then use that to share it with them? See how this can be very much a stepping stone to bring the gospel to somebody who may have never heard the gospel in the first place. So, if this is rapid barrier, how then do we get a fossil? Freddy the fish. So remember what I say, when no one's looking, you take this time a pot of sediment and you very quickly dump it over him. And with lots of water and the right conditions, you might get for yourself a fossil. <laughs> and just like this. See, whatever happened, buried this fish so quickly, it was forever buried before it could even finish its lunch. How long does fish take to finish its lunch? Millions of years? Worldwide flood. But can fossils form that quickly? Well, we actually have this teddy bear that was formed in three to five months. All they had to do was take this bear, put that under a mineral spring, let water pour over that, and within three to five months, the whole bear had actually turned into stone. What you need is not millions of years, what you need is lots of water and minerals 
a short period of time. In fact, I have another bad from this very same spring. It's on the fossil table. At the end of today, go and hold it for yourself and see it for yourself. It was the bad that's made in the same spring just three to five months. In Scientific America, in the 1800s, 1889, they actually had an article of this very spring. In the past, people would try to fossilize all kinds of things. So they take, they'll take carcasses of fox, cat, dogs, bird, in this case a lobster, and you hang it there, the water drip on it. In a short period of time, the entire thing will become encased in stone. In fact, if you read lower down, in one case that um, they were talking about how they actually done that to a cat, and this cat was so completely permineralized that when it broke off his head, no organic material was left. The entire thing had actually turned into stone. Again, lots of water, minerals, short period of time. What about this fossil rose? This is actually a cardboard rose with a metal wire here. How long did this take? This is on the table out there as well. This was made in Czech Republic and it took this another view. Just 10 days. We say two weeks actually 10 days. Right? But two weeks for short. Not millions of years. And you have another teddy bear here from the very same spring. Two weeks. Not millions of years. You see how having a flood makes such a big difference. So people, they come up to me and say, yeah, so maybe yeah, those things are very convincing, but how many of you here have actually heard of petrified forests? Anyone? Well, it's a lot of you. So what's a petrified forest? Well, it's, it's, if you go to the fossil record, you begin to see what appears to be forests, these tree trunks that are running through all these mock layers. And what is in here? What are the mock layers and these tree trunks going through that? In the fossil record, is what it looks like. So how did that happen? If those rock layers, did they form over millions of years? You see, if you look at the evolutionary story, you see those trees were there, and they were there, and the rock layers slowly formed around it. But that doesn't make sense, because this is wood, and wood would rot away. So how then did we get something like that? And you know, some of these formations are huge. Well, when Mount St. Helens erupted, we got our answer. See, Mount St. Helens, when it blew its side, that force caused it to blow many of these trees into a nearby lake. And because of that blast, many of them do not have much bark, many do not have much roots. You may have a root ball here and there, but not much roots, not much leaves. And that's actually what we see in the petrified forest. Many do not have much roots, just a little bit, many do not have much branches. And they begin to flow on the water surface in the nearby lake, this Mount St. Helens, in the nearby lake. This is how they're floating there. As they were floating there, within a few weeks, they rub against one another, and the bark fell to the bottom. And within a few months, the bark began to form low grade coal. And as they were floating there, what happens is that the root end begins to get waterlogged first, and then it sinks and floats in a vertical position. And then soon after, after a few months, the whole thing gets waterlogged, and they begin to fall vertically in that position. So just like what you see here, the root end sinks first, and then they begin to fall in that vertical position. Look very much like a forest. This is the picture from Mouse and Heavens. He said the scientist who did that was actually a very dangerous job, because as he was under the water, he could see this tree trunk starting to sink into the water. It looks like a forest. You see, friends, these things only make sense if you have a worldwide flood. Some of these formations are massive. What kind of local flood could cause all these things to happen? This is a lake that you're looking at. And yet some of these formations are really huge. This only can be explained with a worldwide flood, not the evolutionary story of millions of years. And we can even get hybrid black coal right now. Um, just take lignin, which is the main component of wood, put some acid activated clay, some heat, in this case 300 degrees Fahrenheit, which really isn't much for a geological process. Four to 36 weeks, you can get high grade black coal. Again, loss of water, mineral, heat, and short period of time. Just late last year, it was published that you can actually get algae in your oil in just one hour. Green algae, water, heat pressure. That's all you need. And you know what? They say that the best quality crude oil that you get from this, that mixture has to be 80 to 90% of water. How big are those oil fields out there? What kind of conditions do you require to make those things? You see how the flood again 
makes the difference. So what does the Bible say? The Bible says that God created the world in six days, around 6,000 years ago. See, many people, when they say God created the world in six days, they say, yes, yeah, it's true, you know, but doesn't the Bible also say that a day with the Lord is like a thousand years? Well, it does. But read the rest of the verse, it says a thousand years is like a day. The back square one. See, the verse is not saying that every day is a thousand years. It's just saying that God is patient. He's very patient with us. All right? So what? So where did we get the idea of millions of years? Even if each day is a thousand years, friends, you have to start with six thousand years, not even a million years. So it really doesn't help you. And it doesn't help you to stretch these days out to long periods of time. You see, if you look at the order of creation, it contradicts the evolutionary story completely. One example is this. When was the sun, moon, and stars created? Day four. When were the plants created? Day three. One day before the sun, moon, and stars, which is not an issue. But if you stretch each day out to be tens of millions of years, then now you have your plants going tens of millions of years without the sun, moon, and stars. So why would you ever do that? You end up with a position that is not compatible with the Bible and not compatible with evolution. So that just doesn't make sense. Friends, it's so much easier to just believe what the Bible says. And of course, he created man on day six. And that's just one example. We have many examples here where how on the left side, uh, what the Bible says, contradicts the order of evolution on the right side. This is not fully, there's at least 24 contradictions in the order of creation compared to evolution. But the Bible doesn't stop there. It gives us a chronology. It gives us a chronology from Adam all the way to Jesus. The reason why Jesus, the last man, had to die on the cross was because sin came through the first man, the first Adam. And notice what happens here. The Bible doesn't just give us a chronology from Jesus all the way, from Adam all the way to Jesus. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. But the Bible gives us what we call a chronogenealogy. What's that? A genealogy with numbers, with age. So the Bible says, for example, and this is more, you may not be able to see the numbers, but what it's saying is Adam was 130 years when he had his next son. His next son was 105 when he had his next son. And you have this bad father, so old, next son. This son was so old, next son. You have a complete lineage. You just have to add up the numbers. It can go from Adam all the way to Joseph. We know when Jacob and Joseph lived. We know when it was Exodus. We know when it was the exile. We know when Jesus died on the cross. It's just a matter of adding those numbers up. And fail to get a date from creation all the way to the present day. It's about 6,000 years old, not millions of years. When you have a formal genealogy, you cannot put any gaps in between. So I'm going to explain this as a timeline. And this is a little bit hard to understand, but I need you to follow me. Because if you get this, it will make a lot of sense. Okay, I want you to look at, the, at this top line. The top line is an evolutionary tree. So if you believe, let's draw a timeline, okay? 13.7 billion years according to evolution. Universe 13.7 billion years. According to evolution, man came into the same in the last 200,000 years. Last year they changed yet, so it's 300,000 now. But they're always changing their dates. So 13.7 billion years, man came in 300,000 years ago. Where is man on this timeline? It's at the end of the timeline. If you start with biblical creation, 6,000 years old, Adam and Eve on day 6, we are at the beginning of this timeline. So two very different timelines. In one, the evolution timeline, man comes in at the end. In the Bible, man comes in at the beginning. Two very different timelines. What did Jesus say when he was teaching about marriage? In the Mark passage, it says, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Jesus said that the earth is actually young, not millions of years old. See, the moment you try to put millions of years in the Bible, what are you actually doing? You're putting Adam at the end of the timeline. You're saying that Jesus actually got it wrong. You see why this is so foundational to the gospel itself. And Jesus himself said in John chapter 3, If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? 1 Corinthians 15 says this, For as by a man came death, and by a man has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. The reason why Jesus had to die a physical death on the cross 
because Jesus is the, because that came true, the very first Adam. And Jesus, the last Adam, our kinsman redeemer, the descendant of Adam, came to undo the penalty for sin, which is death. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, not only does he declare the gospel, we have to ask the question, how does he declare the gospel? He goes back to what it says in the book of Genesis. That's the foundation for the gospel. And he says in verse 26 that the last enemy to be abolished is death. Death is an enemy to this world. As I said earlier on, the second most common question we get when we do street evangelism, if God is a God of love, why is that death and suffering? The death and suffering is not part of the original creation. It's all created to be good. But death and suffering came in as a result of sin. But the good news is this, because of what Christ did on the cross, one day death itself, which is an enemy to this world, the intruder, death itself will be abolished one day. Therefore, we have a future hope, a future restoration, because of Jesus Christ. It goes all the way back. The gospel goes back to the book of Genesis. So people always ask this question, you see, you know, so why, you know, so one of the questions we get is, you know, if God is a God of love, Right after Adam and Eve sin, you know, some people ask me, we know that God actually reconciled Adam and Eve back to God. Why? What did He do? He clothed them with skin. They were clothed. They clothed themselves with fig leaf. But the Bible says, when God was walking in the garden, He confronted them, and then later on, He clothed them with animal skin. And that's the first picture of a first animal death, the first animal sacrifice in the Bible. And they were clothed with skin. It's a picture of Christ atoning work on the cross, that we can be imputed with His righteousness. That's the very first theme of the gospel in there in the book of Genesis, and even Genesis 3.15, where the offspring, the seed of a woman, one day crushed the head of the serpent. So we know from Genesis that after they sinned, God actually reconciled Adam and Eve back to himself. And then he chased them from the Garden of Eden. He put a flaming sword on the angel so that they would not go back to eat from the tree of life. Why? He says that if they did, they would be forever. So the question is this, is that is an enemy to this world? Why did, Adam, why did God not want Adam and Eve to go back to eat from the tree of life and do away with sin and be dead? There's a few reasons. One reason is because if Adam and Eve went back and live forever, they're still in a sinful state. They continue to sin. If Adam and Eve live forever, but it's not enough because the whole creation was brought into a curse because of their sin. Creation itself has to be redeemed. And lastly, because of this, Remember what it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. That a seed of the woman crushed the head of the serpent. Who is that referring to? Christ. Christ coming to defeat serpent, to defeat, the, to defeat Satan. And eventually one day to defeat even death. But you see, if Adam and Eve had lived forever, it means that their offspring would have lived forever. Which means that offspring, offspring will live forever, which means Christ, the descendant of Adam, would not have been able to die on the cross. Redemption would not have been possible. So even though death is the enemy to this world, by not allowing Adam and Eve to live forever, he made it possible for Christ to die on the cross so that the entire universe with Christ might redeem from himself a special people. And that's why when we look at Romans chapter 8, verse 20, he says, For the creation itself was subjected to fertility, not willingly, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Who? God. In the hope that creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been grown together in the face of birth pangs until now. That's just what I say. say um, death is an enemy into this world. Sin is an enemy into this world. But by not allowing Adam and Eve to live forever after their sin, it made it possible for Christ to come to undo the works of sin. And that's why one day there will be no more tears, no more suffering. One day they will have a new earth. But you see how all this goes back to what it says in the book of Genesis. If you compromise on Genesis, the gospel collapses. A future hope and restoration collapses. So you say earlier on, we mentioned that the rock layers contain fossils. But what are fossils? What are fossils? Evidence of dead things. Things that were once alive that is now show um, evidence of disease, in this case, cancer, arthritis, bite marks. Is that a good thing? No. 
You see, if you say that, where does this whole idea of millions of years come from? It comes as an interpretation of those rock layers, which contain death, disease, and suffering, which is a problem because if death is really millions of years, they're saying that death, disease, and suffering came before Adam. Here you have none done some bone arthritis. That's not good. It's a result of the fall. And you remember what we said earlier on, or what in the first session, about what the dinosaurs did at the beginning? Before the fall, they ate plants, right? Only after the fall, they begin to eat one another. So at the very beginning, before sin entered the world, every green plant was for food. And after the fall, animals eat one another. And after the flood, God gave Noah permission to eat meat. And that's why we can eat meat today. But that was not what it was like before sin entered the world. But you see, if you believe in evolution, that from one set of millions of years of death, disease, and struggle leads to man, then death, disease, and struggle is not an enemy. In fact, in evolution, death is a friend, death is a good thing, because it leads to the progress of man. And death was there from the very beginning. So here we have the Garden of Eden. At the end of day six, God looked at all he created. He said, there's no death. Everything is very good. If you try to put millions of years of rock layers, what are you saying? You actually say that death, disease, and suffering is very good. Do you see how this affects the goodness of God? Do you see how if you believe in millions of years, you have no answer to the question that everybody has. If God is a God of love, why is there death and suffering? But if you believe what the Bible says, that death is an enemy to this world, the death is here only for a short period of time, but because of what Christ did on the cross, one day death itself will be destroyed then you have an answer to the problem of evil. In fact, Christianity is the only major worldview that has an answer to the problem of evil because in Christianity, death is not part of the original creation. If you go to, um, if you're the atheist, like I said, evolution was there from the beginning. If you're a Hindu, everything is just an illusion. So death is death, why you say it's wrong? How far you say it's a bad thing? If you believe in reincarnation, what is that? It's a cycle of death and life and death from the very beginning. Even the Muslim, the Muslim in the Quran, they say that God created the cattle for food. But that is death. So only the Christian actually is the one that has an answer to that question. If God is a God of love, why is that death and suffering? And to do that, you go back to the book of Genesis. And it's not just death and suffering before death. Because in the false record, we also have false thorns and thistles. But you remember what it says in Genesis? Thorns and thistles came in as a result of the fall. In other words, the entire false record has to be a record of something not before the fall, but after the fall, which means it can no longer be evidence of millions of years. That is a record of the worldwide flood. See, oh Adam, what a perfect world it is. Yes, if all the plants are so nice to touch. Contradicts what it says the word of God. So evolution says that leads to man. But the Bible says that man's action brought death into this world. Two completely different worldviews that cannot be, they are not compatible at all. See, many well, many Christians try to come up with all kinds of explanations. I don't have time to go through every single one of these. But one single thing that all these different views of creation share is that they all try to put millions of years into the Bible. But because every single one do that, every single one requires you to put death before sin. There's only one view that doesn't have that issue, and that's if you take the word of God plainly. You see, here we have actually a quotation from Frank Ziegler. He's a former president of the American atheist. In the debate, he says this, the most devastating thing though that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of biological evolution. Now that we know Adam and Eve never were real people, the central myth of Christianity is destroyed. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there never was an original sin, there's no need of salvation. If there's no need of salvation, there's no need of a savior. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think that evolution is absolutely the death now of Christianity. You know what he is right? If evolution is true, Christianity cannot be true. But can I also say that if Christianity is true, evolution cannot be true. See, the reason um, for the cross goes back to Genesis. 
See, many people, when they, when it's, they, they, one of the things I hear a lot in churches nowadays, they always say, they say, we are a gospel-centered church, we are a gospel-centered church. But what does it really mean to be a gospel-centered church? Can you be, really be gospel-centered if you have really undermined the very foundation upon which the gospel stands? See, at the end of the day, what is your authority? Is it the word of God? It boils down to that. As I said earlier on, I repeat again, Jesus said, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So earlier on, I mentioned Creation Magazine and what, what is that? Well, this is a quarterly magazine that is a family magazine, so nothing too technical with that. But this is something we use that uh, is its main aim is actually evangelism. So for this reason, we do not have any advertising in there. Um, it's a quarterly magazine that we give out once every quarter with the latest news that you can use to share with your friends and families. You see, studies are actually find that here, here, here is a very, very, well, a very well-known Christian researcher. Studies find that the main reason people abandon their Christian upbringing is unanswered intellectual questions. And in fact, here's another one in just January this year, the Barna Group Research. When they actually interviewed students, right, and they say this, that the great, they came to this conclusion, the greatest barrier to people coming to the Christian faith is two things. One, they believe the science refutes the Bible. The second, they refuse to believe the fairy tales. These are the two biggest reasons given. If you dig deeper, of course, that's because of the whole idea of evolution and beliefs of years. And people, they come up, they say, isn't that strange? Isn't, you know, most people, they think they think that somebody leaves the church because of emotional reasons. And I do not deny that they do that. But just think about it. If somebody is offended with a brother in the church, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to reconcile with their brother. But the sad reality is that most people don't do that. When they're offended, what do they do? They leave the church, and they go down to the church down the street. But they're still in the faith. What causes somebody to reject the faith completely never to return? It's when they believe that God's word cannot be trusted. And that's why this is so important. You know, this is the, like you say here, studies after studies show that this is the greatest barrier to people coming to the faith. And when I, you know, two in three, as you saw earlier, who grew up in church, leave the faith when they get to college. And when I speak about creation, people come up to me and two objections they will normally get. One, they will say, oh, you know, creation, evolution, that's divisive. I do not want to touch about that. Or they say creation, that's just a side issue. But think about it this way. If I have three kids and two of them are living the faith and this is the biggest reason, and if I do not do anything about it, who is the one being divisive? And if this is the biggest reason I will not equip them with the answers to their faith, is that really a side issue? This goes down to the heart of the gospel. So let's go back to Johnny. What about millions of years? What about fossils? What about dinosaurs? Imagine now Johnny has the answers to say, come, let me show you from the Bible. Do you think Johnny's witnessing will be far more effective? And do you think Johnny himself will be stumbled by those questions? So that's why Creation Magazine, we actually have um, uh, people writing into us every few days. We have a database where we share testimonies. Here's one of it. It says, at first I shun the belief of my parents, but after living on my own for two years with the aid of a copy of a magazine which I was given one day, I realized that I was the one who was wrong and I asked for salvation. So to be a little bit practical, I just go to Creation Magazine. It's a quarterly magazine. This is a subscription-based one. So you do have to pay for it, unfortunately. So what is this? This is a sign-up form. In a moment, some people will hand this out if they're interested to sign up. So every quarterly, uh, if you fill your details, there's a fine page which you need to read, it's important. Um, every, every quarter we will give you a magazine and we'll deduct 750 from your card until you decide to cancel it. But just fill in your details, your name, uh, and we need your email address and credit card here, yeah, the last four digits. Tear off this top portion and bring it to the book tables at the end of today to collect your free gift. All right? The free gift is only available at our talks, not online. So what, what do we have? Well, um, these are some incentives. Of course, we give you your first magazine, which you take home today, but it's a quarterly magazine. Every other month, we give you a news update, the latest news about creation. 
And what happens is that we also give the email link that you can send your friends, up to five people. So that's why we need your email address. So we send you a magazine, we get back to the office, we'll send you a link that you can send this magazine to five people. So for example, today I can send a copy to, to my kids, I can send one to my grandmother, and they can read the magazine on the computer. So you get a magazine, you get a digital version of the magazine, up to five devices. And then we give you a documentary that used to sell for $19, it's called Charles Darwin, uh, Darwin the Voyage. This is a documentary, high quality documentary on Charles Darwin at the Galapagos Islands. So we do natural selection and all that. And then we give you the form of DVD. So this was the interview that I mentioned earlier on. Here the students give reasons for why they reject Christian faith. Give them their own words. At the end of them, the, all those objections they have, natural selection, medium entry dating, all that. We answer all those questions in the later half of that DVD. So this is what for all this. So you get the first magazine, you get the digital, you get the two DVDs. That's the sign up today for 750. So again, fill in your details. Tear off this corner after you fill that in and pay at the book table at the back. And volunteers can hand that out. So what's the creation magazine as they, as they do that? I'm sure we all know this picture by now, right? Mouse and Helens. Well, one of the questions we get a lot is what about radio metric dating? Doesn't that give the idea of millions of years? Well, so we know here that the volcano erupted, but a few years after the volcano erupted, a lava dome formed at the top. So this is new rock, and we know how old this rock is. So scientists took this rock sample, and they sent it to a lab to be dated using potassium argon. That's radiometric dating, one of the methods. How old do you think this rock sample tested to be? 350,000 years. Then they took this rock sample, and they grind it up and separate that into different minerals. 340,000 years. 900,000 years. 1.7 to 2.8 million years. Friends, this is all from the same rock. And this is new rock. We know how old it is. How old is the sample? That's 10 years old. And it's not just one case. Because scientists have done this in volcanoes all around the world. So here on the left column, we have all the volcanoes we tested. So the location, Hawaii, uh, Sicily, California, New Zealand, Arizona. You have the volcano name and you have the date. Some of them are 50 years, some 200 years, some 1,000 years. And on the right side, the radiometric dates. Do you see that? The radiometric dates give you dates of millions and millions of years. But in every single one of these, the rock samples are very young. And the question is this. If in every single case of rock of known ages, they give us the wrong dates, what makes you think it will work on rocks of unknown ages? See, you don't have to go to all the complicated things, but you have this picture in Creation Magazine. You go to a friend and say, hey, look at that. You can use that to share with them. So if the evidence is so clear, why do many people refuse to believe? Well, as I said earlier on, many people only hear one side of the story. But there's the other side, and there are those who refuse because they know the implication. See, they know the implication of creation. That means there's a creator. That means that we are answerable to this creator. We cannot live our life the way we like. We have to live it according to God's word. So here you have a very famous, world-famous uh, atheist philosopher. And he said this, in, he admitted, he said, I want atheism to be true, and I am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. You see that? You bring them to a place where they have no excuse. Because if there is a creator, then friends, we have to live our life according to the word of God. Romans chapter 120 says this, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, and the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. So friends, that is uh, something in Creation Magazine. So people ask me after Creation Magazine, that should actually be the first new source to look at. But after Creation Magazine, what, what would you recommend? But if you are new to this topic, I would recommend the Creation Answers book. So this book has a top 60 questions in 20 chapters on, that people have on creation or evolution. So what are they? 
What about radiometric dating? What about the dinosaurs? One whole chapter on that. What about um, distant starlight? What about how did the animals get to Australia? Where did Cain get his wife? You know, how did animals live on the ark? Who were the sons of God in Genesis, Genesis chapter 6? So all these questions in this book here, right? So uh, after Creation Magazine, look at this book, next. And if you have somebody going through high school evolution, we have Refuting Evolution, which you read that to counter that point by point. And we have another book at the back, which I highly recommend for high school, high school, high school students as well. I do not have a slide for that because it's actually brand new at the back. But come to talk to me and I'll show it to you. But okay, so maybe these are the basics. And you say, okay, I already have the basics. What's, what's next? I would recommend next to look at Evolution at Clinic Hill. This is actually, in my opinion, the best single DVD um, in the entire creation field on evolution, refuting evolution. We have actually won a few awards for this documentary as well. Highly recommended, Evolution at Clinic Hill comes with a book and goes into more depth if that's something you're looking at. And here's something different. Have any of you heard of UFOs, aliens? Ever wondered if they existed? So in this one, we cover that. So Alien Intrusion, this is a, it's a documentary. We actually came out, this was in the cinemas in January this year. So um, Gabby Bates, my CEO, uh, this is one of the specialist, uh, special, one of the topics he specializes in on aliens and UFOs, and this is a very good kind of message, which you can use to actually share the gospel from there too. Strong gospel conclusion. If you want the best commentary on Genesis, it's the Genesis account at the back there. I think you might only have one book of this left. 800 pages on Genesis 1 to 11, history, theology, and, um, and even church history. It's on history, theology, and um, science. So, Okay, so in fact, in our warehouse, we actually have over 800 resources. So what we have here, we actually bring the best here for you. And I'm just, even that, many people's a lot, so I'm just recommending the top maybe four or five to actually look at. If you like a lot of pictures I have, the quick fossils and all that, it's in this book. It's a picture book. And we of course have for kids, a book on geology and a book on dinosaur. Personally, I really like the dinosaur one a lot. So all the things you saw today, made a metric, uh, carbon dating, dinosaur soft tissue, dinosaur artifacts, they're all in that book. A lot of my slides are actually from this book. So friends, you see, there's actually a battle for worldview of that. One evolution and one creation. It's the same evidence, but starting on the biblical glasses, you come to a very different conclusion based on that. As we said earlier on, the Bible presents the seven seas of history. Creation, curse, catastrophe, confusion, Covenant at Mount Sinai, Christ dying on the cross, and one day in the future, consummation and restoration. Friends, there are answers to all these questions. Of the 800 books we have in our warehouse, 30 years ago, not a single one of them existed. There are answers for this generation that previous generations would never have imagined. So most people only hear one side of the story, like I say, evolution. But there's the other side of the story. And first, I would highly encourage you guys to make a commitment, equip yourself with the answers so that you can make a difference to these people. See, my friend who was, he heard this message, he was so passionate, he said, how can I reach my campus? There are 20,000 people here with a negative view of Christian and religion and of God. You know, me standing here on a Sunday, one hour, or even two hours, I cannot do that. But you know who can? If every single one of you here make a compliment and say, yes, I'll equip myself to defend the faith, to know the answers of all these questions, so that I can reach out to my friends and families, we can do this easily. The figure that you saw earlier on, two in three falling away, will not happen to your families and friends. You see, um, that's a quick one. How many of you have ever heard of that, um, that claim that apes, Chimpanzees and humans are 98.5% similar in DNA. Anyone have heard of that? Do you know where that figure came from? That figure came from the 1970s. When was the Human Genome Project created, uh, completed? The draft for the Human Genome Project was in the 2000s. So this is more than one generation before we had a draft for the Human Genome Project. So where did this number, 98.5% come from? It comes from one of the world leading bird experts. He was using a method that nobody uses today because it's not very reliable, but at the time they thought that was good. 
and he compared the gene and human DNA, it's 98.5% similar. Well, that guy is Dr. John Elquist. Here's news, Dr. John Elquist today is actually a biblical creationist. He has rejected that number. So how similar is our DNA today? It's only about 80%. If you look at our Y chromosome, and Y chromosome is what every male has, right? X and Y chromosome. If you look at a white chromosome and compare the human white chromosome and chimpanzee white chromosome, the chimpanzee is actually missing half of it. And the other half can compare with the humans. It's only 70% similar. Do you see how using something like that can just show from Creation Magazine, John Elquist in the latest issue, we did an interview with him. That figure 98.5% similar is rejected, it's now biblical creationist, and it's only 80% similar. That tells you there is no common ancestry. What the Bible says, science has finally caught up with the Bible. So something like that is what you can use Creation Magazine for. Equip yourself to reach to your world. So here's a summary, we, summary of what we covered today. We look at why young people are leaving the church. We show you the solution to that. We, dis, we discuss experimental versus historical science. We show you how our presupposition shaped the way we view the evidence. Remember the two semicircles. We look at the worldwide flood, evidence for that. We solve rapid fossils, um, the, the petrified fossils, that's the polystrate trees, the formation of coal, oil, rock layers, radiometric dating, and they all tell us that the Earth is young. Also, what the Bible say about the worldwide flood and creation. Finally, we show that the Bible cannot be reconciled out the whole idea of millions of years and evolution. Friends, the Bible can be trusted, and my challenge to you, as I said, is to equip yourself to make a difference. If you forget everything that you learned today, just remember this commandment in 1 Peter 3.15. But in your heart, honor Christ the Lord is holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. We're going to have our ushers come, <clears throat> and we're going to have prayer, and then, uh, and then after that, we're going to sing together a song, and uh, I'll let you know when you're dismissed. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the goodness of this world that you've given to us, the life that we have in Christ, uh, because of your love, because of your grace, uh, you have reached down and touched and won us. Lord, we, uh, we just come overwhelmed with information, uh, overwhelmed with your goodness to us and all that you have created for us. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to learn more and, and to trust stronger in you and your word. And we ask it to the glory of Christ in his name. Amen. All right, if you want to turn in your hymnals to hymn number 73, we're going to sing now our work.
just want to have a record of that. So thank you very much. You are dismissed. <laughs>